for greatness In a sea of the dying and shameless uh, A sea of the aimless I don't wanna be one of the nameless I'ma wake up with the mindset That one day I'm gonna make it And I don't think I'll be fine If I don't break my limitations Don't try to stop me I exist to remember your story Hey everyone and thanks for watching today um, First I wanted to explain um, That American Kinetics And we just call it Axe around here is as you can tell, we're new to the social media YouTube game. Um, for 20 years, this company has been working for the U.S. government, doing intelligence, security, and training contracts. And that client, a specific client uh, that the company had back then, required that no social media exposure of any kind um, was, was allowed. Uh, but <clears throat> once Afghanistan ended, uh, so did that requirement. And the company has been venturing out into social media, uh, but exclusively on YouTube. Uh, Axe isn't on, we call it Axe, Axe for American Kinetics. Axe isn't on Instagram and and truly we don't have any plans to do anything beyond YouTube for the time being. <clears throat> A little bit about us, all our guys are uh, former CIA special activities, uh, GRS, uh, or from the unit, or from development group, or, are, or were CIA contractors and uh, and we're, we're about trying to get you some solid information that you can use, whether it's on gear we use and that we recommend, uh, whether it's on tactics, um, surveillance, shooting, room clearing, whatever, uh, or like yesterday, important current events. Um, Axe values your time and, and we promise to try and improve with every video produced. I know some of them, you know, we, I've read some of the comments that uh, some of the other guys have read the comments and uh, we just want you to know that uh, we're going to do everything we can to get these things out and make them good and relevant for you. We'd also like to know what you'd like to see next, so please leave some comments below. And if you haven't subscribed and clicked that little bell for notification, uh, we'd appreciate it because it helps us grow the channel. Um, lastly, feel free to share this channel with your friends and family on whatever social media platform you use. Again, because it just helps us grow things here so we can continue to put out good content uh, for you. And we're going to try to make it relevant. I mean, there are a lot of guys that, that you know, girls, the men and women that watch this channel that uh, work in law enforcement, military, um, or are just, you know, straight up concerned about making sure their family's safe. And we want to connect the dots and bridge the gap between um, what we've experienced in our, uh, our world and then what the civilian world it has and what the law enforcement world needs. So let's get into part one of today's topic, which is driven by the events happening in Ukraine right now that we talked about yesterday, and that's on the proper mindset when it comes to doing what's going on right now in Ukraine, which is killing gunfighting and tactics. All right, so let's start off with gunfighting. There's a huge difference, first of all, between a shooting and a gunfight. Uh, personally, I would rather be in the former than the latter. Uh, the difference is simple. A shooting is a one-way event. All the shooting is done by me. The gunfight is when your opponent's got the opportunity to actually fight back, and I don't prefer a fair fight. Um, I prefer the shooting uh, to the gunfight as getting shot at leads to getting shot, and I can tell you personally that hurts. So, how do you make a shooting happen? Now, I'm not talking about anything other than legal, defensive, you know, you're taking care of business because somebody has threatened you, your life, or you're, you know, you're required by your job. Now, how do you make a shooting happen? Simply by seeing faster and anticipating the fight. Um, it begins by setting yourself up in a, a tactically superior position before the fight ever takes place. Um, we're, we're going to the range today. That's why I'm like this. We're uh, grab gear. We're going to roll out. Some of the guys are already gone. And, and so I'm going to be practicing later on today. But uh, it involves obsessing over the details of your of solid equipment, uh, your training, your physical conditioning, your diet, and your mindset. And all that is critical to your success. But the most important thing is to have the proper mental approach, the mindset. Because I mean, you can be Superman, able to shoot the El Prez with a pump uh, shotgun in under four seconds and bench press your car, but if you're not locked on mentally, you'll lose because the weapon is an extension of your mind. 
your weapon, whether it's a knife, whether it's a pistol, whether it's a, a long gun, it's an extension of your mind. So let's talk about our mindset. Let's talk about something called the OODA loop. You guys have heard this before, O-O-D-A. Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. That's what that stands for. Um, the OODA loop is a, a reactionary mindset. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of, of approaching a problem. It's what your brain does. So, like this, I'm observing. Before, before somebody gets to shoot me, what they have to do is observe me. They have to foresee me. Uh, then they have to orient themselves towards me. All right, so they observe, orient, then they have to take a decision, a conscious decision to do something, whether it's punch, stab, shoot, detonate, bow, whatever. They have to make a decision to do that. That's the decision part. And then they have to act. And all of those things take a certain amount of time depending on how much training that person has, how much training that person has put in, and the work that they put in on their side. So we know that the human body reacts in roughly a quarter of a second to stimulus. Uh, to some stimuli, it takes about a quarter of a second for my brain to register something happened and for me to make one motion towards that thing. So inside that OODA loop, that's why when we train, we train to have our people, uh, our students shoot uh, from the holster just a straight draw. Their, shoot, their shot time um, is going to be 1.5 seconds is what we're trying to get them at, but if they get under two seconds, that's good, and that's at seven, uh, seven meters, seven yards. Um, and the reason we choose that is because it gives us the opportunity to, um, to observe the bad guy, right? They're coming, they observe us, orient, decide, and as they're starting their action, we're already engaged trying to get inside of their OODA loop before they can close their loop of orient, observe, orient, decide, and act. We're going to make ours a tighter loop because we've trained ourselves to see something and react to it faster because we've built, as we talked about in a previous video, those neural pathways. Uh, so that's the OODA loop. Ori observe, orient, decide, and act. That's the process the brain goes through to take action against someone. And that's what you have to be able to do is make a tighter, faster loop. And the way you make a tighter, faster loop in your mind is by drilling, training, and working on things. Uh, on the range, um, in just your everyday life, being aware of things, trying to anticipate, like, what is that car going to do? What I've done before is watch a boxing match uh, or an you know, MMA match, and I've tried to clap my hands before that guy throws a punch. When I see him about ready to make a move, um, I'll try to clap my hands and anticipate or see that guy telegraph his movement and then jump in ahead of him and get that done. Just a little small, silly drill I do, but uh, it helps in that, in that regard. Now, so that's the OODA loop. That's observe and orient, decide and act. But we have to even set the stage further back than that because we have to have the groundwork laid for how do we even pay attention to what's going on in our society, in our world around us, right? How do we remain alert like that, all right, to be able to see that thing taking place? And this is where uh, Colonel Cooper's color codes come into play. And I know you've heard these before. So the first color is white. The first color we've got is white. And white is when you are mentally asleep, like. Imagine um, a millennial walking across campus, head down in the phone, has no idea what's going on. They're just cruising, looking down here. They have no idea what's going on around them in their world. They're in white. Um, from, from white, then you've got yellow. And yellow is um, fighter pilot awareness. Yellow is what, if you're not inside your home, if you're not, well, doors locked, uh, dogs out, kids in the bed, you're safe, right? You're in the green zone, so to speak. If you're not there, then you need to be in yellow, period. Leave your house, boom, I'm in yellow. Driving my car, I'm in yellow. That means I know what's going on spatially around me. If I'm in a room, I know if somebody comes in that room. Um, if somebody is in the room and they go behind me, I know where they went. I can kind of describe them if I have to because I've taken a snapshot of that person. I'm aware of their positions. Uh, I know when they came in, if they had anything in their hands or not. Um, these sorts of things, when you're uh, out of your home, you should, you should be in yellow, in a, in a vehicle. Uh, what vehicles are around me? How close are they to me? How far down the road can I see? Uh, what obstacles are in the road? I'm looking as far down as I can to see what's going on. And in a large space, I'm looking up in the balconies. I'm looking down the hallways. I'm looking for the exits. I'm looking for the doors. 
That's yellow. You are aware of your world. Fighter pilot awareness. They know what is in their airspace. So that's, that's yellow. After yellow, we go to orange, right? Orange is you are alert to a potential problem. Right. So let's let's say you're in your house. You're sitting in your you know, your uh, your easy chair. Right. You got your feet up. You're watching TV, and kids are in the bed. Dogs are out. Alarms on. It's nighttime, and you hear a pot, planter pot that's on your balcony railing outside your sliding glass door. You hear that pot fall and break outside. Right. You've gone from watching TV to suddenly boom. You you can almost direct your hearing towards where the sound came from. You're alert, you're paying attention to what's going on. You've pulled up the legs on your chair and you're sitting forward and you're listening, right? You've gone from basically uh, green, right? You've gone from I'm just chilling at home to orange. I'm completely alert to what's going on around me, right? And, and now let's take it a little step further. Um, the next step would be red, suspecting danger, right? Red is something's going on here. So that same scenario, you're sitting at the edge of the chair, you just heard a pop. Next thing you hear is your sliding glass door start to move. Somebody's pulling on it. You can hear that pulling on it because that's not a wind noise. Now from there, that is when you suspect danger. Now you're going, you're grabbing your, you're grabbing your device to get to work and now you're in red, right? Red also for operational guys is every time you drive through a choke point, right? A choke point is where you're choices of direction and speed are dictated by the terrain and you can't decide where you're going to go. You have to go down that alleyway. You have to go down that one-way street. You have to go down that wadi. Uh, you're in red. You're suspecting danger. It's an ambush opportunity. Okay. So after red comes black. Black is full-on combat, man. You are engaged. Um, it is a gunfight. It is a fight, whatever type. Uh, so same scenario, you're sitting there, you heard it, you were in orange, you moved to red, you got your rifle, you got your shotgun, your pistol, whatever. Then all of a sudden, six ninjas come flying through the window on ropes with their samurai swords out, and then you, it's a game on right there in your den, and you're just right in your den, right? That's black. Okay, so white, yellow, orange, red, black. Question for you to think about is this. Can you go from white to black without going through those other colors. Think about it for a second. Can you go from white to black and skip the middle? Absolutely. Why? Go back to the millennial with a phone in a hand walking across campus. They have no idea what's going on around them. They take a wrong turn. Boom, they get mugged, smacked in the head, phone stolen. They get their crap kicked in right there. They went from hero to zero and skipped everything in between and they have no idea how they got in that spot. Right? So that's the color codes. Now, those color codes, it kind of gives you a framework. So now you can sit here and say, when I leave the house, I need to be in yellow. Right? Okay, something changed in the environment. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe I need to go to orange. I need to be paying more attention. I need to make get my family closer to me or behind me. Um, and then we go to, hey, I see a guy with a gun. He's moving across the park. Okay, now, pistols out. Family, we're out of here. We move to red so we can avoid going to black. So that's the color codes. And that helps you as you're getting ready to... Um, hopefully avoid getting into black where the, o the OODA loop comes into play. So hopefully that kind of ties those things together. Once, once you got all that framework done with the mindset, you kind of started to train your mind like that, you move on to training your body, right? Training the body. Beyond shooting, beyond shooting, you got, physical fitness is critical to mission success. I mean, the better shape you're in, the less likely you are to get hurt. And if you do get hurt, the good thing about being in good shape is you will heal faster, right? Uh, when I got shot over, uh, when I got shot, um, I was in a hotel swimming pool in Dubai. Ten days later, doing laps in the pool, I took I took rounds in my uh, shoulder and my back, and within ten days, I'm I'm doing the breaststroke in the pool. Um, I made some folks mad who were vacationing there because there was a little faint blood trail of pink every now and then as I would swim, but. You know, the point is my body was healing quickly because I was in good shape. I, you know, I was working it and you got to do that. You'll heal quicker. And, you know, I've just, I've watched too many people today who rely on their weapons to solve all their problems. The problem is, you know, they'll, they'll rely on, well, I've got a, I got a really good pistol or I've got a pistol plus body armor um, or I've got a crap ton of magazines. 
Uh, but the problem is you have to move that weapon to a solid shooting position not once, but maybe multiple times during an engagement. And this requires strength, it requires stamina, it requires endurance. And a lot of folks just don't have the physical conditioning to get to or to stay in the fight. Right? Imagine somebody started opening fire in Walmart or Costco or something, and you're in the back of the store. You don't know where they are. Now you're breathing heavy. You got your weapon out. You're moving. You're trying to secure your family, and you've got something taking place up there. But now you're out of breath because you're out of shape. Right? So these things are, you know, this is this is important stuff for us to make sure that we're in good shape. So that's the the physical side. Now let's talk about training. Let's talk about. But let's, let's talk about competitions versus reality for a second. Um, you know, let's face it, competition's fun. We go to the range, we do competitive drills all the time. All of us are always trying to uh, outdo the other guy. Um, it's fun, and if it's applied correctly, it can help you in your marksmanship, your weapon handling skills, and your confidence. But with the positives that come from competition, uh, also comes um, potentially, potentially bad habits of moving too fast for the tactical situation, right? Um, in real life, the bad guy and how fast he falls is gonna dictate the speed of that fight, right? You, you can run all day, but if you run to your death, I mean, you did yourself no good. Um, <clears throat> it might be a fast process, or it might be a slow process depending on the bad guy and how fast he falls, uh, the bad guy dying, but you should get in the habit of solving one problem at a time before moving on to multiple threats, right? You use your cover and you take that opportunity to find one, deal with it, move to the next one, deal with it. But don't rush out there and try to get everything done at once. You're going to die. Um, you can shoot two rounds on paper or you can, you, can, you can ping a piece of steel and you can move to the next target. But in reality, two rounds or the sound of steel being struck, it may not solve your problem. So train yourself to shoot until it goes away, right? Think about this for a second. Um, when do you stop shooting? Until whatever you're shooting stops doing what you shot it for in the first place, right? In, in one engagement one night at about seven yards under nods, uh, I punched the guy twice with uh, five, five, six rounds, and then I stopped for just a split second on that trigger looking for a response from that dude. Um, we were trained to do controlled pairs, right? That's not a double tap. A double tap is just bang, bang. A controlled pair as I see the sight, bang, I see the sight, bang. Not double taps, there's a difference. But So I, I, I popped him twice and watched for a second. And that was dumb of me. Uh, the prop, because the problem was that he's still standing with his AK. And so I hit him with two more, ba-boom, before he began to fall to the ground. And I, I couldn't believe it, but as I watched, he stood back up before he collapsed a second time, before his... Uh, hydraulic fluid leaked out and he lost pressure and died. Um, lesson learned from me. Shoot until they go away. Not one, not two, not maybe three. Uh, so what we did was we, we adapted a version of the bill drill, right? You know the bill drill, it's six rounds, right? The benefit of the bill drill is not only does it uh, teach speed and recoil control and the ability to follow the sights, but it conditions shooters to not uh, be locked into stopping too soon. Um, we shot five to the body and one to the head, right? The bill drill is just dump six center mass. We would go five to the body and drive one to the head, and if he's, that's just if he's still twitching as a failure drill with the rifle. Um, why five? Um, because it might take the human body that long to react to the trauma that you're inducing with five, five, six, or nine, or whatever you're shooting. Um, at the time of the engagement I just described to you, uh, we were using military green tip, uh, AP ammo, and the energy transfer with that round was minimal. Um, realizing we had a stop and power problem, we developed that drill uh, that would work on any determined individual, and we made it part of our training package on pre-deployment workups. Uh, so there's that. Now, now let's shift gears and talk about equipment. <clears throat> As an operator, uh, whether with GRS or Ground Branch, uh, my body weight was around 185, 190. Uh, but when tactically loaded with a weapon, vest, helmet, it was closer to 245, 245 pounds. Um, and that was just assault gear and not a rucksack. Um, fast, fast moving work, 
or it requires that you move efficiently and swiftly in and around and over obstacles with all of your gear on. I, I, we tried to slim everything down to absolutely what was necessary to get the job done with not a lot of extra stuff. Um, I've watched individuals pack their vest, pack their plate carriers with excess ammunition or equipment. Um, it, it, it was a mental comfort item maybe, but it was not mission essential. And you know, uh, ounces equal pounds and pounds equal pain. So the less I can carry just what I need to carry, the better off I'm going to be. And you know, this, this causes problems in movement, um, fatigue, no matter how good of shape you're in, if you overload your body, you're going to eventually have the same problem that a fat guy is going to have just because he's out of shape. So physically, you need to be able to move through an obstacle course with all of your gear and ensure that you can fight with your combat weight, whatever that might be. Uh, for, you know, for you as a civilian, um, you know, a parent, whatever your combat weight is, you know, spare magazine, pistol, tourniquet, um, you know, whatever it is, you got to be able to fight, move with that. And also, you quickly find out what stays on your body and what falls off when you do that, when you do that run. Um, we'd make new dudes that would come onto the team run a full sprint with everything. We'd tell them, say, go in and get everything you think you need. They'll come out and run, and it looked like a garage sale behind them as crap flew off. Um, I saw a Glock 19 one time bouncing down the field behind a dude. It was unloaded. Uh, obviously, it's clear and safe weapon, but still, the point. So you make changes as necessary to your equipment. Um, you you tape or you tie the gear down. Um, my my gear back here, like this uh, this belt. My um, you know I've I've zip tied things down to this thing just so they don't come off. And uh, same with um, same with the plate carrier. You know I, I zip tie these things down so that these things don't don't come off. Um, if endurance is an issue, get in shape, man. Hit the pavement. Get in the gym, or, or better yet, do both. And you know, if, if when you're looking in the mirror, you see yourself, and you see that you're wearing like an overlapping gun belt. You know what I mean? Do something about that. Do something about it. You know, cut the sugar out and do something during the day. Um, as for combat loads, right, let's talk ammo and what you carry. Look, look at how much ammunition and how many weapons you are carrying. I've watched folks carry 12 to 20 magazines on their body, and in my opinion, way too much, way too much. Uh, you cannot effectively maneuver with that weight, nor can you sustain any aggressive operational tempo for any length of time. Uh, generally, Four to five magazines in a disruptive environment is more than adequate for any situation that, that, that I've ever been in anyway. Um, I mean, okay, do the math, right? If you critically hit a bad guy with one out of three rounds that you fire, that is 10 people per magazine, assuming you've got a 30-round magazine. So you carry four magazines, and you're looking at 40 people that you critically injured. You've taken off the battlefield. Multiply that times four operators, four guys on a team, and you have 160 people that you have taken off the battlefield. I hope you get the point. If the situation becomes so critical that you need more ammunition, then the situation is going to be one where you're going to have plenty of dead and wounded on your side who will not need theirs anymore anyway. If it makes you feel better, keep a few extra mags in your, in your truck, right? Or, or yeah, just... Do that. Let's, let's talk for a second about mindset when it comes to training. Uh, my firearms training began at a, a Western Intelligence Agency with a 9mm Browning high power pistol. Love that gun, but it had limited bullets when you compare it to what is available today. I knew on the range I only had 13 rounds and that I had to make each round count and I developed a mindset of dedicated accuracy, even though I might be able to, I might be a bit slower than the shooter to my left or the shooter to my right, only to make sure that I hit that target every time. And this mindset of controlling your fire, being accountable for every round, and being as accurate as you can with solid grip, good trigger control, and good sight management, um, this mindset carries over, for me, down into my future career, right? So generally, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and those North African areas, we're fighting, uh, we just call them haji, right? We fight hajis wearing flip-flops, pajamas, carrying an AK-47 and two magazines. 
Um, and they're on their own turf. They know it better than we do. Uh, they're acclimated to the high altitude. Um, we would carry an oxygen sp supplemental oxygen bottle sometimes because we get up so high. And these guys could run circles around us if you came into the fight and you were too heavy. Um, I, I would carry. I'd rather carry four or five magazines and be able to move and outmaneuver Haji than be slow and sluggish and let them get into a better tactical position before I was able to. Um, also, if I, if I shot up all my ammunition wastefully, there is no ammo ferry that's going to be uh, bringing me more stuff once the shooting starts. So <clears throat> I learned, and the rest of my, my buddies and teammates, we learned to, to be efficient with what we had. There's no full auto fire. I mean, you're just you're taking well-aimed single shots, right? Full automatic is for the movies and for the dude with the belt fed, and even then he's controlling what he's putting out. Um, so let's talk the fight, tactics, and setting up your opponent next. We push the use of cover to all our students. Brick walls and dirt will stop a bullet better than a plate, right? Um, plates limited in size. Many of the competitions that I've been in and, and watched um, have the shooter exposed to multiple targets during the course of fire, right? They're out there just running and gunning. Um, that's okay for the game, but if you overexpose yourself to multiple opponents in real life, they can all shoot at you at the same time. But you can effectively focus on only one individual at a time. What's the result? You lose, right? So. Learn to engage and learn to expose yourself. Train to expose yourself to one threat at a time. Um, you know, and to take that a little bit further, maximize the use of cover and minimize your exposure, right? Make the bad guy give you a full body shot to engage while you only give him a muzzle and an eyeball. That's all, that's all the dude needs to see is a muzzle and an eyeball from you. In short, um, you know, as far as that, all that stuff goes, make yourself a hard target. That's what it amounts to. Um, most of the friendly casualties that, that I saw were shot when they failed to use cover or they stopped in the open and stopped moving, right? That's, that's how you, you're going to get shot like that, no, no doubt. Um, but this is also, flip the coin, this is also how I engaged most of the enemy that I know that I got solid hits on. They were stopped in the open or they were in, or or I was engaging movers from a stationary position myself um, within 100 yards. And at 100 yards, they generally require a center hold for a solid hit. Uh, you don't have to lead too much at 100 yards with 5.56. Five, but referencing shooting on the move, um, it's, a, it's a skill that all shooters want to learn. We all want to know, how do I shoot on the move? And we, <clears throat> we spend a, a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to master that. Um, I'll be honest, I've used it very few times in a fight. I, but usually, when, when I'm moving in a careful, careful hurry, I'll stop, I'll plant, and make my shot, right? Not run, bam, shooting on the run and all that. Um, it's doable, and I've done it, but it's not the preferred way to do it because you can't, I mean, your hits are not guaranteed. Uh, when the bullets are sailing past you, um, I was sprinting from cover to cover, moving too fast to shoot, you know? Um, I didn't find that there was an in-between. Uh, if I slowed down enough to make a good solid hit under fire, I was an easy target, so I just elected, I'm not going to do that. All right? I'm going to skip that. <clears throat> um, as for shooting and closing on my target, right? it sounds good, uh, it writes good for magazine writers and movies and stuff, um, but it only makes the bad guys more accurate because you're walking into a muzzle that you know, it may help me test my new plate carrier sooner than I wanted to, and I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, diagonal movement works, right? Uh, you know, he's here, and I'm moving to the side as I'm doing my business. But again, if you have to slow down too much, you're an easy target, and generally, and are generally going to be in the open. So speed is your security in this case. You've got to get to a point of cover, right? Cover to cover, shoot from from cover. Um, guys, uh, we hope that this video was uh, helpful to you as you train. I know it was a little long. Uh, whether you're in law enforcement, military, or a parent making sure that your family's safe, um, you know, in our ever increasingly chaotic world, um, you know, Ukraine, Russia, who knows what's happening next. But 
uh, please subscribe and spread the word about our channel um, and let us know what your thoughts are and what you'd like to see next. Uh, we've got some good stuff coming up. Um, we've got a laundry list of things that we're cutting videos on. Um, you're not going to see me every time and I know probably some of you are glad about that. So stay tuned. Um, I, I got to run. Uh, it's been like 30 minutes doing this video and the range day ain't getting any longer. So um, be safe and uh, God